And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, live from a disgusting and rainy New York City on a Friday afternoon, where I'm excited to continue a tradition, a September tradition, which is that Zach read books in the <laughs> off season and gets to have the authors of those books, if they're even tangentially related to basketball, on this podcast to make me look stupid in comparison. But I am excited to have the author of Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World, and the sports gene from, I don't know, a few years ago. Time has just passed. Um, my former Columbia Journalism School classmate, David Epstein. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to have you here. This range made the Europe trip cut, and uh, I, <laughs> I quite I quite enjoyed it. Um uh, and uh, it's it's good to see you. And congratulations, by the way. Congrats! Like New York Times bestselling author of the Sports Gene. It says that on the cover of your book. That means when you write another book, is it? It's going to say like two time New York Times bestselling author, and then it's just going to compound itself. You're just going to be a multi time bestselling author. I, I guess so. The publisher, I guess, range has been the number one in the sports book category for the New York Times monthly list, just ahead of Andre Iguodala. So now they tell me. I didn't think that counted to call yourself a number one New York Times bestseller, but apparently they're going to put that on the book. So I think it counts. Andre's <laughs> book, they, Andre's people mailed me a book that has been lost in the mail, and I, I, I want to read it, so I'm just going to have to buy it. Somewhere there's an Andre Guadalla book floating around ESPN that's for me, and someone took it. I think someone took advantage of my absence <laughs> to take my Andre Guadalla book. It's, it's, I, it was me because I wanted you to take my book on vacation instead. It was a good vacation book, although my wife really – I'm so old – I'm forty. <laughs> I'm forty two, going on like eighty. So we're packing for vacation, and four hardcover books have snuck their way into our suitcase. But because I know I'm going to get yelled at, we own a Kindle. <laughs> we have a Kindle, and I refuse to use the Kindle. I I also have this problem, although I've I now use both uh, because it got out of hand. So so I like because I'm like I can't, you know I like to dog ear and take notes, and and my wife is like you. Technology has updated such that, like, you can do those things electronically. I still like the feel of a print book. I have to say, though, I do use the Kindle for a lot of, like, work reading because you can take notes and then export them, uh, which is actually really handy. So you can have, like, all your notes as, like, a script, basically. Uh, my wife is very happy that I read the book Range. If I had to summarize Range, I would say um, it's that it generally helps you to have broad knowledge and to not – dig too deep into just one niche area of expertise. And that goes for sports. It goes for how you make decisions. It goes for your career and the subject matter that you become um, an expert at. And so I was cooking dinner last night because it's the off season. And like, you know, once or twice a week, I try to pretend as if I'm a contributing member of the household. <laughs> and so I'm cooking enchiladas. I'm struggling. Like the Blue Apron recipe is 45 to 55 minutes. I'm like over an hour already. And, it's, it's not, and my wife is like, "This, you are living range. You said on vacation that you wanted to have more range in your life. This is the kind of thing you have to do. So you've now, because of you, I now have more household obligations. So, okay, so your wife has me to thank for bad your bad cooking. cooking. Okay, all right, well, um, so, I, I take some honor in that. So, um this book spoke to me on, on a lot of different levels, um, and I will start by telling a story. Um, Ron Adams is a assistant coach for the Golden State Warriors. He's sort of the dean of NBA assistant coaches. He's a 70-something guru, um, and obviously I've been around the Warriors quite a bit in the last six years. And every time he would see me, we would talk basketball, and then he would say, so what are you reading? What are you reading? And, like, I don't want to hear about basketball. What are you reading? And five years ago... I would have like good answers to that question. It would be like something about Syria or the sports <laughs> gene or something about, you know, something real. And then we would have over wine or something, a 45 minute conversation about electoral politics. And then like every time he asked me that question, my answers would dwindle, dwindle, dwindle. And then I would be like, Ron, you know, honestly, I'm just watching film of so and so running the pick and roll and blah, blah. And he would say, you're doing your work a disservice. You're, you're doing you, – you think you're doing yourself a service by reading only about basketball and focusing only about basketball. Actually, your work will be better if you have something in your bag that is not – is something literally in, your, in the bag you're dragging around, this arena, something that is not about basketball. And I'm like, well, maybe – maybe – I'm sure you're right, but it's very hard to extricate yourself from the trap of being specialized, right? And I feel like that's – 
that's the most interesting thing about your book is the world is all trending in one direction, which is specialize early, specialize deeply, even media, right? Like mm-hmm. they're like, you got to know every salary of every NBA player. And it's hard to talk yourself out of that. So how have you been able to talk? You wrote this book. Do you feel like you're living this book? For sure. I mean, and, and this brings me to a question that I have for you too. I mean, I, I was like living in a tent in the Arctic when I decided uh, you know, for sure to become a writer. I was in grad school in geology. Um, and I arrived at Sports Illustrated, um, as a temp fact checker, maybe six years older than people who were, I was doing the temp fact checking for, but pretty soon realized, uh, my very ordinary science skills were totally extraordinary once you put them in the context of a sports magazine, basically. And so that sort of allowed me to to sort of zoom up once I realized it was this oddball background that I had uh, that I turned to advantage. And I, I still have no idea what I'm going to be when I grow up. I have no idea what I'm doing next. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you, you were a crime reporter at some point, right? Uh, yes, this book spoke to me on that level, too, and that um, I not I, I part of the lesson of the book is that people – um, who achieves any measure of success often feel as if they have done so in a crazy circuitous path that is counter to what they've been taught, which is if you want to make it in journalism, you got to intern at the, at the local newspaper when you're 18, right? For the college newspaper. And I was, did none of that. Me neither. Um, I was a high school teacher for two years. Um, then I went to get my PhD in U.S. history and had a moment that is very much like some of the moments that you talk about in this book where I, I'm doing all this research. Um, into such a niche, like not even a niche. It's like whatever is below a niche. Like, <laughs> like, like, um, if some, like, I always make the joke of like, if you wanted to write a book about butter churners in like 17th, 17th century Philadelphia, there's probably 80 people in the world who would be like super passionate about that book and you could win some history awards and like, would you really feel fulfilled? And I decided I wouldn't. Um, so yeah, I had a totally non-traditional background and I do feel that that has helped me in, in, um, People ask me, like, how how can being a crime reporter help you cover the NBA? There's, like, a million different ways, not the least of which is if Greg Popovich yells at me, I don't get scared because I've actually been in scary situations. Yeah. And, I mean, so I, I was – my first sort of stable job was as the midnight to morning guy at the New York Daily News, right? Like, nothing happy that's going in Daily News happens between midnight and 10 a.m. And I always recommend, you know, that – that job to young journalists because you can get it if you're willing to work starting at midnight and you're reasonably competent. And it's like an incredible boot camp for how do you handle uh, tense situations? How do you handle people whose emotions are running high? Um, how do you track people down when you don't, you know, have a phone number that you can just like look up on the internet? It's an incredible boot camp, but nobody really wants to do it, right? Because it's not the job they want to end in and they sort of want to skip ahead to being specialized in whatever they're going to be specialized in. So I, I think to me, one of the themes of the book, although this would have made like a terrible subtitle, is the things that you can do that cause like the most rapid short-term apparent progress towards your goal often actually undermine your long-term development. And it's these sort of zigzags and broad toolbox that you build on the way that that once you arrive at some degree of specialization, which we all do eventually to one degree or another, it's, it's what tools do you have at your disposal? So so let, let's, let's, let me bring this to the MBA because a, a, the second half of your book is a lot about decision making. It's a lot about making predictions. Mm-hmm. Who are the best people at predicting what's going to happen in the future? Who are, wh- what is the best way to implement a decision making process? NBA teams are living that every single day. Who are we going to draft? Who are we going to trade? Who are we going to trade for? And um you, you talk about how the best decision makers are people who have or or the best the best groups at making decisions are people who have uh, are groups that have people from dissimilar backgrounds that have voices that say lots of different kinds of things. And I, I thought of NBA teams. And I thought a lot of NBA teams are naturally structured around basketball lifers. Now, now there's analytics people, mm-hmm. but analytics people come in um, and they become their own brand of basketball lifers. So my question to you was, um, A, have any teams in any sport after reading this book come to you and said, hey, you want to sit in and, and see what kinds of groups we have making decisions and be like, should NBA teams hire completely random smart people to come into their front office? Like I'm talking about you're from Goldman Sachs, you're from you or you're a history professor and you want to like, should they just hire people who almost know nothing about basketball? Come in here and maybe you'll help us. That's an interesting question. And there's a there's a bunch of questions there. And so one of the first teams I heard from or at least some 
some members of the team were the Cleveland Indians, actually. So obviously in baseball. And they, I think, have been sort of progressive on this front. They, there's a guy named Jay Hennessy who was the head of BUDS, which is basic training for Navy SEALs for a long time. And then he retired like two years ago. And he had such an interesting background, was such a sort of a voracious reader and learner that they basically made up a job for him to bring him in. I think his title's like VP of learning or something like that. It's not a job that existed. It's like, we want this guy in, so we'll just make up a job. And I actually think that's a really smart thing to do. And so that organizations, I don't know if they should just like pick someone off the street, but that they should look for that kind of outside voice. I mean, the way I think about this is, you know, some of, some of the, uh, the research that I think is relevant in the book was actually done on lab meetings in scientific labs by this guy named Kevin Dunbar at the University of Maryland, where he spent years sitting in on labs, seeing what leads some labs to make breakthroughs and others uh, not to, even when they encounter similar problems. And essentially what he found was it was when they run into something unexpected, which is usually where the big opportunities come, the labs that could marshal the largest number and widest breadth of analogies to the structure of the problem were the ones that made breakthroughs. So like once he was sitting in a lab, it was all E. coli experts and they get stuck on something and they don't have this wide range of analogies. Another was like a chemist, a physicist, an undergrad, a med student. And they throw all these analogies from these different domains. And they solve it right there in the meeting. The other group takes like six months to do it. And so I think you want to, especially in sports, you want to broaden the analogies you can draw on because there's interesting research that shows that People who are evaluating athletes, if you give them the exact same scouting report and, on an athlete and the only thing you change is the name of the player that you analogize them to, like in the introduction, it completely changes how they evaluate the player. And so I think you, even within the sport, you want a huge background of experience so you're not uh, relying on that single analogy that causes this huge bias in how you judge them. Yeah, that that I, that's in my notes of things to bring up. All right. Like, 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 the, like the description. Of, so you mean literally um, – the description of the player could be exactly the same. Six foot tall, good passer, good left handed dribble, whatever. Except if the headline is similar to Steve Nash and the other headline is similar to Trey Burke or yeah. something, someone who's been a bust. Like that, the, all the other stuff is now, is now gone. Yeah. Well, it makes, I mean, the, the, the other stuff still has some effect, but it, it's remarkable how much it changes the evaluation, right? And so you have to wonder, like, when someone like a uh, Jeremy Lin is passed over, is that because the analogies that are made for him are, are, maybe not as good as they should have been um there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in here about if you get too many like-minded people together the decisions that are made are bad yeah um and and that obviously has a lot of implications for for basketball and it's why like i often think of um it it, i often think of like uh, a a guy i'm gonna have on next next week um is a guy named sam anderson who writes for the new york times magazine who wrote a book a wonderful book about oklahoma city and the oklahoma city thunder um, and he's not a basketball writer. And I think that someone like that who comes in, who's like, I don't really necessarily care about like how Russell Westbrook and Serge Ibaka run the pick and roll, but I'm going to, I'm just going to watch this team. They're going to bring something. They're going to discover something that I will not discover. Like, I think that's insanely valuable to have that kind of perspective come in. And I, that's why I kept thinking of like, if I'm building a team, how do, how do I engineer that in my front office? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, honestly, one thing I would do, and I think, I think maybe I took one of the questions you asked in a different direction than you expected talking about predictions. Cause there's one chapter that's totally about people making predictions. And they're awful at it. Like the yeah. more expertise you have in a specific area, almost the worse you are at predicting what's going to happen. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that expertise is bad, but it's the narrow. So this was a 20 year study of people making very concrete forecasts and like geopolitical and economic trends. And the people who performed the worst were the most specialized scholars. Like they'd spent their entire career on one or two problems and they come to see the whole world through this like one lens or mental model. Um, and the, they were beat by these essentially sort of generalists from the public who were widely curious, who read a lot. So the, the, what the researcher called foxes, right? After this parable, the hedgehog knows one big thing and the fox knows many small things. And, and the foxes did much, much better. They even beat, um, groups of intelligence analysts who had access to classified data when they didn't. And it turned out that it's not what they think, but how they think. And they treat all their ideas as hypotheses and they kind of politely antagonize each other and interrogate their beliefs. And when they get in groups, they actually become 50% more accurate in their predictions as individuals because of the way they kind of politely and curiously antagonize one another. If I were on a team, some of those people, you know, 
the intelligence community in the government is now turning to them. And if I were on a team, I would just go take some of those people. Like you, you there, these are like the best forecasters identified in this incredibly rigorous study. I would go see if any of them are interested in working for a sports team. And they're going to ask questions that you are not going to really, that, that other people may not ask or may not ask in the same way. I mean, it is somewhat analogous to a Daryl Morey coming into basketball through the side door 15 years yeah. ago and just basically saying, why don't we shoot 53s a game? Yeah. Like what would, what would happen if we did that? that? That's a really interesting thing, right? Because in some ways, in retrospect, how obvious is that? Right. And yet how long did it take to come along? Right. So, and I think, you know, another thing that's relevant to this, you want what, what's called the outside view, right? So Daniel Kahneman, the, who won the Nobel Prize for, uh, co-won the Nobel Prize for illuminating cognitive bias. He and a colleague, um, coin these terms, the inside and outside view. And the inside view is what we usually take, especially experts, where you focus on all the details, all the little things in front of you. And so let's say you're trying to predict a horse race. You know all the details about a certain horse. The more you investigate any single scenario, the more likely you are to say it will occur. Whatever scenario you're investigating, whether it's how a player will turn out well or how they'll turn out poorly, whichever one you spend that time on, you're more likely to say it will happen. In fact, in studies, sometimes people have to investigate multiple possible scenarios for an outcome. And if they spend a lot of time investigating each one, they'll add the total probability above 100% of whatever's going to happen. Because as you focus on more details, you say something is more and more likely to happen. What you want to do is is zoom out and take what's called the outside view, where you try to look at other structurally similar cases before you think about any of the details of the, of the person or situation you're trying to evaluate. Yeah, you have this line in here that to me sums up that for group decision making, you said the experiments showed an effective problem solving culture was one that balanced a strong standard practice. So you got to you got to have your you know this is the way we do totally. This is the decision making structure um, with forces that pushed in the opposite direction, and that's like how do I get that? Because I do I have that that is persuasive to me that that's important. How do I get that? And I don't know I don't know the for an NBA team I don't know what the answer to that is. Yeah, I think that's a really tricky question, especially because. Um, I think most people in sports are not able to kind of operate on an ideal timeline. Um, I mean, I don't know how you, you know, feel about Sam Hinkie, right? But, uh, I know, you know, some people make fun of him for the process and all those things, but it wasn't really allowed to stay around to let it play out, right? I mean, maybe, maybe this was the best case scenario for the 76ers because they get to scapegoat someone and still get some of the benefits of the players. But, um, what you want to do is balance how people are held accountable for their process as well as for the outcomes, because you want them to stick to certain, uh, be accountable for how they make decisions, right? But also feel somewhat free to improvise when they realize that process is, is not the best. And so the organizations that do this well build in, um, cultural cues that make people feel accountable both for their process and for the actual outcomes. The problem is people don't enjoy that kind of culture as much. They, they find it they feel like it's easier when they know they're either going to be evaluated by process or just by outcome. Sports, usually it's just by outcome, outcome right? And so I would add some accountability to people for process. But that means that when something goes wrong, uh, you can't say that the process sucks necessarily because that's going right. to happen. If, right? if something goes wrong and, and the lead up to it was right, you have to be able to say, OK, well, sometimes it happens. Like I, the process was good. Good job. Like I, I know this guy's yeah. this guy failed, but good job. I mean, in, in Astro Ball, right, that's the book about the Astros process. Um, and they missed like they had a great process. They found some incredibly undervalued players, you know, took them to the World Series, but they missed on like J.D. Martinez. I mean, J.D. Martinez, they missed on like a player that came back and, and kept them out of the World Series. So they made some huge misses, but they had some big wins and they had a good process. One of my favorite bits in the book is um, it's one of the early geniuses who made Nintendo what Nintendo <laughs> came to be. And I think I think it's him. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he had he 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 began to sense the paralysis of of groupthink taking over the company. And so he developed a habit where they were in brainstorming meetings. He would on purpose yell out crazy, stupid ideas to make people feel more comfortable sharing ideas that they probably think 
are crazy, but maybe are smart. That was fascinating. Yeah, this guy's name is Gunpei Yokoi, and he uh, – so Nintendo was a playing card company founded in a wooden storefront in the 19th century. And when he arrived there, it was still Which a – Which I didn't know. That's that, – I had no idea. Yeah. He, it was still a small company when he arrived, only making playing cards, and he was hired as a machine maintenance man. Right, so he really brought an outside view, and he turned it into a toy and game company. Um, and you're right, and he said in retrospect later in his career – that he was lucky he came to an immature small company because as it got bigger and more mature and they had entrenched processes, people became more rigid and didn't throw out those those ideas that had worked for them in the past. So he would just start meetings with a crazy idea. And I think this resonates. I, I didn't write this part, but with this idea of the Overton window, which is the window of things that are OK to discuss, essentially. And, and politicians use this like very, um, you know, very proactively, where if you say something extreme – People won't adopt the extreme thing, but it will move the Overton window in that direction. And so politicians do it over and over and over to move the discussion. And I think what Yokoi was doing is not hoping these crazy ideas. He's literally called them himself stupid ideas. Yeah. Not that those would be adopted, but that it would shift the window toward like innovation thinking and away from conservatism. Well, that, that that's easy to that that's easy to think about in the context of sports, right? Is like everyone talks about we want a healthy culture where everyone's ideas are valued, where everyone gets in a room and is not afraid to speak up. And the most famous recent example in the NBA is in the twenty fifteen finals when Nick Uren, who was the assi- assistant to Steve Kerr, like his personal assistant, but has a basketball background and blah, 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 felt comfortable when they were down 2-1 to Cleveland saying maybe we should start Andre Iguodala in place of Andrew Bogut and just start super duper small with Draymond Green at center. And it was that – like they had played that kind of lineup before, but to start it in the finals against a team that was banking on its size and Tristan Thompson and Timothy Mozgov was sort of a gutsy move. And like that guy's idea – like he was not afraid to speak up. And then you hear stories of when the Nets – um, traded everything for Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce. There were maybe one or two dissenters in their front office who felt um, overwhelmed by the ownership's desire to go for it and the higher ups' desire to go for it, and too scared to come out and just say, "Hey, look, this is dumb. Like, we can't yeah. do this. This is crazy." Yeah, I mean, they should do some of what psychologists call red teaming, which is um, attack the decision instead of trying to say when it will work, why it will work. I'm sure once someone commits. To wanting a player or going after a player, then they fall prey to this sunk cost fallacy, right? Which is once you start investing time, energy, money, or emotion, you're more likely to say everything's going to work out, even if it to an outsider it looks ridiculous. And so what you need is somebody saying why this isn't going to work. Some strategy that some businesses use is when they have an idea, they jump ahead to assuming that it failed and explaining why it failed, like as if they're trying to predict the future. Like what are the reasons that this wouldn't work out if it doesn't work out? And you know, I think that's an interesting example you use of of bringing creative thinking to the NBA. Because I can say this is this is a little off topic, but my impression of the NBA when I've interacted with people there, and that's usually more on the sports science side and the you know athletic trainers, and is that there's a little bit of a don't break anything culture where the players are so skilled and there's so few of them that instead of taking some risks to maybe develop them in the best way possible, it's like just don't break anything, like don't. Hmm. You know, don't don't work them. You know, in some sports, you you put more stress on people in order to to make them less fragile. And, and I understand why that's the culture in the NBA because I think like there are athletic trainers and strength and conditioning coaches who, you know, if they lose that job, the next one down is a long way down. Um, but I do think there's some of that conservatism in the culture because of that. Uh, the sunk cost thing. I, I literally just in the past few days, I was talking to someone with a team who, in the last let's say five years, has drafted a player. Player has not worked out. Player still has trade value because people are curious about about this player. Hasn't played much, maybe you know for whatever reason. And there's someone wants to trade this player. Like we should we should jump on that because you know guy hasn't worked out. Let's get something. And some of the stakeholders are so invested in this player's success, having selected him, that it's just a non-starter in the organization. And so I think the most likely outcome is he fails again. And has no more trade value. So they're going to miss an opportunity. It's not going to be a big opportunity. But it's not like they're going to get huge amounts for this player. But it was it just it, – it made me think of all of this stuff. Yeah, that's – I mean, we're, we're all bedeviled by this sunk cost fallacy. I used to – I grew up in Chicago and I used to think of it as the Bears quarterback fallacy because they would spend a lot of money and continue playing a quarterback even when they obviously shouldn't do it. But it's because you spent the money, right? And in this case, I mean, it, interestingly, con men – 
no to draw people in by asking for a bunch of small things and trying to get their emotions involved first because the more times you interact with them and give them something, the more likely you are because of this cognitive bias to say, well, it's definitely going to work out because I've been investing something. Even when to an outsider, it's clear that you're headed for disaster. When you're talking about these sums of money and the emotion they must put into signing these contracts, like that is absolutely ripe for falling prey to the sunk cost fallacy and holding on to a strategy or a player long after you should have parted with it or them. People, do you ever feel like ticketing websites make getting to the event difficult on purpose? It's as if they're so big and so unwieldy they can get away with not caring about the customer experience. But with millions of live ticket events and price match guarantees, SeatGeek has proven there is a better way. You can search for sports tickets, music tickets, comedy tickets. The NBA season is right around the corner. Go to your favorite NBA arena. SeatGeek has the tickets you're looking for all in one place. No more going to 17 secondary market sites. It's all on SeatGeek. They built the fastest way to find tickets. It has an easy to use rating system, color coded. Green dots mean good deals. Red dots mean the deal might be overpriced. It rates every deal from one to 10. That's pretty easy to use. It has an interactive seat map. Every purchase is fully guaranteed so you can shop for tickets with confidence. I've used SeatGeek many times to buy tickets, including to Broadway plays and stuff. It's fast. It's easy. It saves you time. And SeatGeek right now will even give you $10 off your first purchase. All you need to do is use our promo code. So download the SeatGeek app today. Use promo code LOW, L-O-W-E, my last name, the name of this podcast. Bam, $10 off your first purchase. That could be a a decent percentage of a a sporting event, a baseball game, a basketball game. That's promo code LOW for $10 off your first purchase with SeatGeek. This is apropos of nothing, but I I just couldn't believe that this was true when I read it in your book where there was a study – you can explain it better than I am, but better than I can, where people were given a choice to read literature that was contrary to their views on a particular issue and get paid money for doing it or not read it at all and not get paid money. And correct me if I'm wrong, more people chose to not get paid money rather than to sit and read like a page of – some some position paper that disagrees with you about a hot button issue. That's right. And I actually got some interesting criticism about this study. That's right. So this was testing like how willing were people to entertain ideas that weren't theirs and on lots of hot button Just issues. Just fake it. Just give me, I'll read a piece. You're going to pay me money. I'll right. read a piece of paper that's like c- contrasts with my view on abortion. I'll fake it. Yeah. It, it didn't say that you had to adopt this view or defend it, right? It was just read it. And so one of the you know one was one of the topics was gay marriage right and so some of the, some of the criticism i got now i didn't do this study right i'm just writing about the study was why should you why should i read a contrary opinion like that there's only like one opinion that's correct if you believe in human rights and while i agree with that it was again it wasn't asking them to defend the view um or to adopt the view it was just a question of would you read someone else's view and and, and most people said no when it was a hot button issue that's that's that was insane um, to me, a lot of it, a lot of, of a lot of range and a lot of a lot of it is really about developing your brain to think a different way, to think broadly and to ask the correct questions. So you have this famous thing and, and, and I you have this you have this example of um, there's a famous I don't want to get too much into it, but there's a famous sort of uh, riddle almost. That's the race car problem, which is like you have all this information about a race car and when its engine fails and under what temperatures the engine fails. Should you – here's the information. Should you race in this big, big race um, knowing that there's X percent of chance that your car could fail and your whole thing will be over or should you should you delay? And the only secret to solving the problem correctly is to ask for a little more information about 25 races that are not uh, – you don't know what happened in these races but you could easily get this information and no one asks – the and the professor even cues them up saying, hey, business school students – if you need more information, just ask. And no one asks. And it just made me think of like you just – the first question that you are trying to ask about almost anything. And, I, and this this could be as simple as like what, what, sh- how, what lineup should the Orlando Magic play? I'll go in and I'll start watching film and looking at numbers and seven more questions will arise that end up being more important than the one I was going to ask. That's really interesting. And this – that's – you're right. The professor cues these students up, and they're, these were the ones I wrote about were Harvard Business School students, right? So they're not uh, – no dummies. Presumably smart people. Yeah, and and one of the things he pointed out – and it could, because in class, some of the students said, uh, well, but you didn't give us that information. This is just a class, so we should assume you know, that you gave us all the information. He was like, yeah, right. You know, it, When you go out in the business world – 
you're going to sit in on a presentation and someone's going to give you the presentation and that's the same thing. You'll say, well, that's all the information there is. This is actually a cognitive bias that some people call what you see is all there is, right? You assume that everything you're seeing is all the information you need to make the decision. And in fact, you're not looking at things like when nothing extraordinary happened, right? You only look at the cases where something extraordinary happened, or in this case, where the engine of the car failed in this exercise. Not all the cases where the engine of the car didn't fail, which is information that you need to make decisions. It's interesting you mentioned that chapter because that was one where actually a couple people involved in analytics and basketball reached out to me and said, including Seth part now who was with the bucks but i think just left he's um, at the athletic now uh saying this kind of decision making with incomplete data this is what people don't understand analytics is all about like you're trying to be less you know marshal enough information how can you get more information to be a little less wrong you can't make the decision for a coach or a team you're always doing it under ambiguous um you know ambi- with ambiguous information you just you just try to cut your chances of being wrong a little less by bringing different types of information to the table. Let's bring it even more to sports. Um, you start the book with contrasting um, Tiger Woods with Roger Federer as someone who from literally infancy is directed into a particular sport and another athlete who experiments with lots of different stuff, you know, and and credits that experimentation with sort of the, the broadness of his tennis game. Um, you know, I, I thought about this in relation to um, – you probably saw this. Baxter Holmes wrote a, a two-part series for us about mm-hmm. injuries and in basketball players and the toll that playing 9,000 AAU games as a 12-year-old is taking on peop- on kids and that surgeons are seeing in basketball players and uh, like an alarming number of 11-year-olds who have torn their ACL or 12-year-olds whose meniscus is, looks like a 40-year-old Sean yeah. Kemp or something like that. So that dovetails with your first book, The Sports Gene. And I, I just wondered in thinking about specialization and like you, you obviously talk to sports scientists a lot. Um, what do we know about basketball players now that we didn't know when you first wrote this book? Like is, is that problem real? And, and you just mentioned before, you know, the, the culture of don't break them. Like what do we know about the, the typical 22 year old American basketball star? Yeah. I mean, they are coming up right with a lot more mileage on them by the time they get there. Uh, and this is a problem in every sport, right? When I was living in Brooklyn not that long ago, there was a U7 travel soccer team that met near me, right? I don't think anybody thinks that six-year-olds can't find good enough competition in a city of nine million people that they need to travel. But there's all these other interests in it, right? Adult financial interests and all that. And I, I thought that series was great, by the way. And there's interesting research tracking young people and looking at when they suffer these so-called adult-style overuse injuries. And the best predictor of that is how specialized they are. And I thought that would be, when I first read that, I thought it would be like the number of hours they spend in sports. But it turns out if they diversify the sports they're doing, there's some protective effect. So it's not just the total load. It's like there's something beneficial about broadening your physical training early on. And some places have adopted this. So like Cirque du Soleil, it sounds crazy, but I spent some time with the physiologist there. They have amazing data, right? They have former Olympians who are doing 100 shows a year. And they decided to teach a lot of their performers the basics of like three other performers skills. So taking away time from them practicing what they have to perform. And they found they compared their injury rates next to Canadian gymnastics. And they found it decreased injury rates by 30 percent compared to Canadian gymnastics. Not doing less time, but diversifying what they were doing. So if I I were a team, I would be all over that. I would try to work it into the pipeline, right? Because by the time they're in the NBA, as that ESPN series showed... It's kind of late, and I think one of the reasons people are in don't break it mode is because they're getting things that are on the verge of being broken. And so I think it would be better for everyone if we we diversified, uh, you know, included training variability in, in their in their development. Have you heard from the tiger mom in the wake of this book? No, but I met her while I was reporting it. Yeah, and I have to say, I give her credit. I think the book was more reflective than people give her credit for. I, so I've never, I have not read the Tiger Mom book. Because, okay, so it got super famous when it was, the beginning was excerpted in the Wall Street Journal. It was the most commented upon article ever in the Wall Street Journal. And the first page of the book does promise the secrets to raising successful children. And, you know, she assigns violin to one of her daughters and, you know, presides over five hours of practice a day or whatever. But she does write later in the book, her daughter says, you picked it, not me, and quits. Right. And so, that, so that's in the book. It's in the book. That's but, not like but nobody sub- remembers that part. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it wasn't in the Wall Street Journal excerpt. Right. And that's actually exactly in line with research on why young musicians quit. The most commonly reported reason is the instrument they're learning is not the one they'd like to be learning. And so I, I give her credit for putting that in there because she certainly didn't have to. Um, 
I, I I was hoping that she would have contacted you afterwards. I I thought about um there you hear all this you hear could still all, happen only three months out. You hear all the time like I just thought of Mono Ginobili who you know people are like how, how did he get this this crazy footwork that no one had ever seen before. And there could be five different reasons for that. But one of them is that he grew up in a soccer playing country and played soccer. And, you know, and then and, and Federer talks about that too. Yeah. His footwork is he owes it to the other sports that he played that weren't tennis. Yeah. You know? I mean, I think the athlete with the greatest footwork I've ever, I don't know how you would quantify this, but whatever. My, the, who most impressed me with his footwork is Vasil Lomachenko, you know, who's was the quickest to win, uh, boxing titles in three different weight classes ever i think and he his father had him he started boxing he got exposed when he was pretty young but then his father had him take four years off to learn traditional ukrainian dance and stories about him often say like well his footwork's because of the ukrainian dance but when he's asked he says it's not just that it was also the basketball and the gymnastics and the soccer and the dance and all this other stuff so he actually did a ton of different stuff so you have a kid now but your kid is obviously far too young to to be in these kind of conversations yet, but like maybe I mean this was this book is actually my plan to you know get the competition to ease up. So oh, uh, there you go. So <laughs> we're all we're all going to go the other direction. Yeah. Uh, and and um, I just think as a parent, it's so. I or my daughter's four and a half. I already and we live in New York, so there's hyper competitive people all around. And like I already know parents who are assigning like as of, of a year ago, like like extra math homework for their three and a half year old and you hear stories like that <laughs> or but you hear stories like that and you're like yeah and, and uh, my wife and i have told ourselves like everything that's in your book is what we have told ourselves like we're not going to pre- we're not going to press any kids we have into anything too early we're not going to be those parents we're not going to be we're not going to force them into an area of specialization and like really hammer them we're not doing any of that but then as everyone around you starts to do it you can see how it becomes a self-fulfilling mechanism of like everyone's doing this. And so I found most interesting in the book your your snippets about people who are actively trying to reverse this trend. And I'm I'm interested to see like like you have to you there's a certain helplessness that you feel and no matter what, no matter how often you tell yourself, the evidence in your book suggests that it doesn't matter. It's it's better if you meander around or it's it's like you you also have stuff in your book about how when you try to help kids solve problems, whether they're math students in eighth grade or maybe a toddler doing a puzzle, you're doing them a disservice. It sucks to watch them struggle. You want to watch your kid. You want your kid to be the fastest to do the puzzle. Like, cause that's a great sign. Oh, there, look how smart they're going to be. But actually the struggle is what makes them better at solving problems that are unpredictable that they're going to come across in life and not having the answer spoon fed to them is very important. But all of this is like, it's hard to yeah. actually do this when everyone else is doing the other thing. Yeah. And these are the so-called desirable difficulties, right? And, uh, the problem is they cause performance, whether it's a physical skill or a fully cognitive skill to suffer in the short term. The person learning is more frustrated. They rate their own learning worse. Having to go, ha- not being helped along. Is right. what you're saying. They rate their own learning worse. They rate their teacher worse too, right? So something in sports and, and in math learning that's really important is practice variability where instead of doing the same thing over and over and over, you mix up what you're doing and it makes it more frustrating. The person said their, their apparent progress is slower. So they think they're learning less. They rate their teacher worse, but then they do better in the long term, right? So the, the, the principles of the best long term development are sometimes at odds with the fastest pro- progress you can make right in front of you. And when I think that becomes really dangerous is when we set up structures that make it so that if you don't um, cater just to the short term, right, where that that you're not allowed to participate anymore, right? So if, uh, you know, if we were selected, one of the things like in youth basketball teams, one of the reasons you see this relative age effect, if they're selective teams, where if you push selection really, really early, then you end up, the coaches end up selecting kids who are born early in the birth cohort right. because they're just more biologically mature and the coaches mistake that for talent or potential you're, you're, i'm gonna be facetious but your scholarship enemy malcolm gladwell has written about this in, yeah. related, in relation to hockey in canada right? yeah Did yeah you? and he was totally right and but then it disappears at the top level so you're really missing people like it goes all the way right up to the top level but so if you enforce selection earlier and earlier then you're incentivizing people to do what works in the short term but not what's best for the long term so there's these competing forces of what we know about the best long-term optimal development versus other people who have incentives 
to force parents to think that selection should go to like three and four and five year olds and so that they force them to try to make the best five year old when we know the way to make the best 20 or 30 year old is not the same as the way to make the best five or 10 year old. It's and all of the like I thought about lots of things, but like when, when I do my job, when I'm thinking about basketball issues, even just NBA issues, I try to call lots of different people. And my favorite people to talk to are the ones who are going to who I know are going to say something that I never would have thought of. We're going to take my brain in a different direction. It's very interesting to think about. Um, what's I, this is totally broadly based. Um, what are the most common basketball related conversations you have? You've 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 dove deeply into sports science. You've now dove deeply into decision making. Teams have reached out to you. Organizations reach out to you all the time to speak about these kind of things without revealing necessarily specific people or teams. Like what kinds of basketball related conversations are you having? Uh, it's usually sort of abstract in this this analytics I mentioned, which is um, asking about how other organizations that I'm familiar with deal with the issue of integrating analytics into their decision making. It's like, how do you deal with, uh, you know, taking data when it's not perfect? Cause I think, I think there's, I don't, I don't know what's in the head of the average fan. So it's hard for me to know, but there's probably more feeling that like the data speaks for itself than is really the case. Like it has to be interpreted and the coach is the ultimate decision maker just goes into the stew for or the coach or general manager, or whoever it just goes into the stew of decision making. And so you're necessarily always dealing with these ambiguous decisions. And so I think a lot of the questions have been about how do you deal with that and how do you incentivize people to um, dissent from these decisions? Right. Uh, so that's a lot of it. And then then there's sometimes there's sort of more micro stuff like I mentioned very briefly. Um, in range that Shaquille O'Neal, instead of shooting free throws from the free throw line, should have been shooting from like a foot in front of and a foot behind because you want what's called practice variability, where his problem was his motor modulation wasn't fine enough. And so you don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over. You want to do it a little bit differently, right? So one of the studies huh. I, I mentioned in range is piano players who are being taught to make a 22 key jump with one of their hands and some groups are do the 22 key jump like a thousand times and the other group does that like 200 times and then they do other different space jumps 200 times each and when they're all brought back to be tested it's the group that had the variable practice that that, that does, does better, better. At, at the at the 22 key jump and other stuff but they don't do as well the day of right they don't make as much progress and so i've definitely had conversations about practice variability and what are good ways to to kind of work that into training and and you know i kind of think i kind of think some of the really good players and coaches do that intuitively like what's the the guy who was sort of like a ball handing, handling guru for some people, um, it's like Steve Francis, and then he was, I can't remember his I, name. I know, I know you're talking about, Ravine is his last name. Yeah. Um, I think. Yeah, no, it, it well, He's in Chris Ballard's book, The, yeah, the Hoop yeah. Whisperer. I think basically what was useful about him is that's what he was doing by like throwing, making people catch tennis balls while they were, he was just incorporating some practice variability. And you see things that like Steph Curry's doing, you know, shooting all these weird shots and punting and all this stuff. I mean, you must have a tremendous amount of practice variability that, that he incorporates just by apparently having fun. Sometimes for inspiration, you just have to look up. My wife and I were just in Europe, and I said the most underrated thing that you can do is look up when there's all sorts of cool stuff up. For more than 60 years, the Goodyear blimp, blimps are cool, has fueled greatness on the gridiron by providing aerial coverage of some of the most legendary moments in college football history. When the Goodyear blimp rises above a stadium, it inspires players to reach higher and rise to the challenge of the game's biggest moments. Now it's your turn to go further with Goodyear. Discover tires made to rise above the rest. Learn more at Goodyear.com. Goodyear more driven. The Sports Gene, your first book, is filled with just so much fascinating research about the importance of genetics in determining who is successful at what sport, from long distance running to basketball, which has an obvious genetic component of being tall and having long arms, to sprinters, Jamaican sprinters. What I'm, I'm curious, like, what has changed since that book came out? Is there anything, is there any science that you write about in there that has been called into question? I don't know if I would say – well, at first when I wrote about it, the I didn't expect the 10,000 hours rule to be like the most controversial part. But, <laughs> but that was – obviously my interpretation was called into question. But there was just a replication of the original 10,000 hours study published last month and the original did not replicate. Really? Not even close. What is So what does that mean for a, a lay person like me? What does that mean? That means that the, the, the conclusions of the original study can basically be assumed to be false. So the 10,000 hours study for people who don't know was this famous thing that if – the, the I, I, I may be summarizing it incorrectly, but to have to master a task or to master a, master a skill, 
you need 10,000 hours of what they call deliberate practice, which I don't know what the precise definition of that is. But it keeps changing, so it's hard to know. Right. Um, it, it seems at this point to be practice that which did in retrospect cause someone to get better, which is obviously an unfalsifiable definition. But um, the original study was just done on violinists, and the scientists themselves would never call it a 10,000 hour study. But anyway, what basically what their claim was that was that only the amount of deliberate practice, which is this effortful focus practice, differentiated the level of these violinists. And that turns out actually not to be the case. They published some additional st- this paper was done 1993 they published some additional statistics from that paper a few years ago that showed in fact that was not true that some of the lower level violinists had practiced more than some of the highest level violinists and then it was just redone published last month and for example one of the highest level violinists had practiced 4000 hours and one of the lowest level violinists had practiced 11000 hours so there was not complete correspondence between training uh, and performance uh talent matters and there's a lot of work that shows that um what from the sports gene is is most relevant to basketball as you've as you've thought about it all these years later after writing about it? I think well, I mean, there's the obvious height stuff, but they know that. Right? I remember when I was doing some of the the body type analytics, I went to Daryl Morey because I noticed that he the Rockets had disproportionately drafted a lot of the guys who were short but with really high wingspan to height ratios. And I went to talk to him to ask him about this. And the first thing he said was, you're not going to find anything we haven't found. I'm like, I'm not trying to. I just want to write about what you found. And then he said, I can't be a source for you on this. So I think it was like, obviously, they were looking for guys with like short necks, you know, so they seemed smaller than they actually were and this kind of stuff. But I think everyone's everyone's on to that sort of thing. One thing I mentioned in the sports gene that I didn't even think of as relation to basketball is that another problem with early selection is that the later someone has puberty, the taller they're likely to be. So I think when you see someone like Giannis, who basically seems like he went through puberty, you know, partly after he got drafted, like we should keep the pipelines open. We should try not to deselect people too early if we don't have to, because the people who have those late growth spurts often end up being really, really tall. You know, that was like Scottie Pippen, um, somewhat Michael Jordan, Dennis Rodman. Again, I grew up in Chicago, so I was following these guys and their growth spurts. Uh, so I think we probably select out a lot of people too early. Um, even for those physical characteristics, because we cause we force selection to happen so early. One of the general questions that you that yeah, everyone spends a lot of time thinking about is, um, and it's this is a little bit facile to put it this way, but the concept of being injury prone, mm-hmm. um, and because there's there's a there's a, a culture in sports, or there has been, where well, there's no such thing as injury prone. You're just like. It's just tough. You're, some people are tough, and some people can tolerate pain, and some people can't because they're tough. And some, you know, some people can play through injuries because they're tougher. So whatever it is, like, um, what does injury prone mean to you? Yeah, I think, I think there are there are people, and there is some genetic evidence that there are characteristics of some people's like connective tissues that cause them to be more likely to tear a ligament or something like that. And I think that is true. But I, I don't think that's the largest effect of why some people get injured. And if certain teams or trainers are having people injured over and over, I think the first question they should ask is, what are we doing wrong to them? Right. Instead of like, they're just injury prone. I, Cause it could be they get injured easily, but, um, in, you know, in some European soccer clubs, when they used to call people injury prone all the time, and then, uh, and I write about this a little bit in the sports gene, then they do some analysis and see that, the most explosive guys have certain muscle fiber types that cause them to be more likely to get injured if they have high volumes of training. And those are the guys that you really want. But if you put everyone on the same training and some guys get injured and you say, well, they're injury prone, actually, they're just the most explosive and they can't tolerate that same volume. And so while I think there there is some reality to people being some people being injury prone, just like there's some reality to some people getting any kind of illness, um, that there should be more responsibility on on the people who are uh, training them and dealing with them when when they get injured. And and again, I think all of the focus and some of it good in the NBA has been on load management to prevent injury, which is good. I'm glad to see that that term has now made it even outside the NBA bubble into just like the sports science culture bubble. Yeah. Well, someone okay. So someone from the Raptors asked me if I knew when the term originated, load management. And because I guess there was an argument about if they invented it or not or something like that. Do they want credit for it or do they not want credit for it? I don't it? even know. I wasn't told I bet that. they don't want credit for it. I bet they want to I don't I, I don't think they want to be known as the load management team. But I went like looking through for whatever stupid reason, like looking through some of the scientific literature and it turned out it's like 
way earlier it's been dealt with with nurses like how much does their performance get worse as their load goes up so load management was like a term in nursing for a very long time and obviously it's a different kind of load but the same principle basically and so i think the focus on load management is good but that we haven't gotten the focus on how do you put in other types of work and maybe more work for people to make them less injury prone, right? Like in a lot of other sports, you put in certain types of work to make people less injury prone. You don't just have them do nothing to make them less injury that, prone. That's interesting to me because you do hear this like you, – you, Jeff Van Gundy has come on my podcast before and said, well, how do, how do we know any of this works? Like we're doing all this load management. No one, no one plays back-to-backs. Everyone's resting and blah, blah, blah. And like injuries still happen. Injuries go up. Injuries go down. This guy still gets hurt. And like – it's easy to dismiss that as the rantings of an old school person who doesn't understand um, why these players have to sit out games or a coach who wants all of his best players available to play every game. But he's also not wrong. Like, it's, and so like, I, like, I, I just wonder like how that would, um, how a team would actually do that. Like how a team would actually um, imp- like do what you're saying, like other work, like what could, like, does yo like a lot of teams do yoga now? Does that count as other work? Um, I think yoga counts. I don't know a ton about yoga, but there are athletes like endurance athletes, mixed martial artists, th- those kinds of athletes have to train against injury. I mean, they manage load at the same time, but they do specific training. I mean, when, when people get an injury and they go to physical therapy, what they're doing is being, if they're with a good and aggressive physical therapist, is they're being trained to, um, be steeled against having that injury again but you should do those things proactively so some sports scientists are now calling it prehabilitation where you do things um that that uh endurate you i think is the word whatever make you more durable essentially um and so i think that should be combined with load management load management i'm sure will be more like because of last season and Kawhi Leonard and everything will will become a fad but I think it would be best if it were combined you know and maybe you take those games off that's when you should do some of that work i don't know that that'd be something i might try um, how, how are teams using, um, if, if anything, like what, what's the next like frontier of genetic profiles to like make decisions about who to draft or who to trade for? Like what it, teams don't have access to necessarily all those kinds of records and medical reports, but like, what have you heard about, about that? Yeah, I think there are some, some sports organizations in other countries that are trying to do that. And I don't think they should. In fact, I don't know if I'd say we're, we're lucky or not, but it turns out that, um, some like really dramatic things are caused by a single gene and we thought that was going to be everything because early on we found like the low hanging fruit that causes certain things. But the v- large majority of traits and complex traits seem to be caused by these huge constellations of lots of different genes interacting, which means that it's extremely difficult, you know, not to mention the environment um, on top of that, which means it's extremely difficult for us to actually have substantial test that would tell us much of anything and so in the most for the most part you're much better off testing someone's physiology directly because then you're getting a look at their genes and the environment they've come up through whereas genetics might seem sexy but it's like you know why use height genes when you could use a tape measure sort of thing and i think that's the situation we're going to be in for a long time where people are selling genetic tests to teams and they're sometimes buying them but they actually aren't adding any value well it's interesting you probably hear more of these stories than i do but you can't even keep track of how many sports science companies are coming up are yeah, popping up amazing. every six months and teams teams increasingly are frustrated because they can't figure out which is snake oil and which which isn't and they invest heavily in one of them and it turns out like well this machine didn't even really work the way they thought or like we, we didn't learn anything from this like it, that that it's such a it's bec- they don't know what to do with it um i don't know what like i don't even know what i'm asking but like i i just i can't imagine running a team even if i had a science background and trying to figure out how am I going to direct my, let's say, five hundred thousand dollar annual yeah. budget for toys to figure out what's actually? To, 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 how am I going to use that money? Yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, uh, a former writer, five thirty eight, science writer, I love named Christy Ashwand, and she recently wrote a book called Good to Go. That's basically an examination of the entire industry of sports recovery science I gotta, and products. I gotta, buy, I gotta buy this book then. And it's like the main conclusions are well. People have actually, some people have actually been critical of her book because they say, like, I bought this to know what to do. And basically, it mostly says all this stuff is BS, right? Which is the truth. A lot of it is BS. But I, I thought it was more than that. It was sort of these habits of mind that are important. And, and I think she even writes a little bit or at least talked a little bit about the Warriors where, like, all these teams are using biometrics or blood markers to see if people are recovered or not. And it turns out, and I think this is something the Warriors do, although I don't have, like, firsthand knowledge of this, that 
players keeping training journals is actually a much better sign of like when they're heading to burnout or injury. Than question, our, a lot of teams do questionnaires now. Like every day you have to answer a question about, and it's 15 questions about how you're feeling, you know, but I don't know what the specific questions are, but it's, it's to, it's to implement that kind of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, so it, it, exactly. And that turns out to be a better direct measure than all these. And, and, and it turns out that because some of it is, psychological so to speak right like there are these studies that show college injury rates go way up during exam time so there's obviously something about like emotional stress or they're getting less sleep or whatever i didn't know that um and so i think they should look for uh kind of people like christy some years ago a team one team asked me to recommend a sports science coordinator to kind to try to sift through this sort of stuff and i made a couple recommendations and they didn't take them and they hired a very prominent scientist and then got rid of him the next year because they were saying basically his approach was here are the results from the lab do with it what you will well the warriors to years have changed their training staff has changed over you know three or four times and i don't know what's going to happen in the wake of well that's an interesting one have you dug into the recommendation that Kevin Durant play game five of the finals at all have you read up on it have you looked at i mean that that in i don't know how long it's going to take for all the there's going to be stuff that still comes out about that, but that's yeah. going to be an interesting, isolated case of how much did we know? What did we know? What did we not know? Why was this decision made? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any special insight into that case, although I will say that I was intuitively, when they were just saying calf or whatever early on, I was like, I was skeptical of the, you know, the way he was sort of like limping and, and keeping out for calf. I'm like, there's probably something. So I don't know that they knew, but I was very suspicious and i was talking to this guy i talked from the mayo clinic all the time and we were saying we're both very suspicious that there's not just like a calf that wouldn't be keeping him out you know what with your calf would be keeping you out that long so i think there was probably something else there but but that's this whole other decision matrix of are you doing what's in the best long-term interest of the player or of your team and there's like you know if it's not the finals of course you can just sit him and so what risk are you willing to take there? well that's that's i think what frustrates people about this whole arena is that there is no way to know. You yeah. can't know. And a lot of range is talking about making decisions. And sometimes all you're doing is training your brain so that when you face an impossible decision, that you approach it the correct way. And that could mean you give this example of the Challenger explosion. And like one guy, I don't know if it was at NASA or somewhere, I can't remember, saw something in an image of whatever internal structure screwed up inside the Challenger and was like, boy, that doesn't look right to me. That looks bad. But there was no way to quantify that looks bad. There was no way to go anything beyond that looks bad. And it turns out that guy was right. And that thing that he saw was why it exploded. And it just reminded me of like you talk to the directors, the directors of sports science at teams and they're like, there's no like a lot of it is just feel. A lot of it is just I'm making a hunch at the end of the day. But they don't really mean feel or hunch like it's a gut feel. It just means like I have all this collective wisdom. I know how to look at things. I know how to look at a guy's movement. I know how to look at the medical records. And like if I see something that's gnawing at my brain, like could be wrong, could be right. But like I got to make a decision. And it's just when they say it's just feel, they just mean it's sort of like the feel you get from a cumulative experience and a cumulative way of thinking about a problem that leads you to this decision that might be right or wrong. But at least I, I think they have a better chance of making it right than like another person does. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's. Right. It's, it's all again, it's it's like the foxes, those best forecasters. Right. It's not what they think. It's how they think this approach that they bring. And hopefully they sort of play lawyer on both sides of the argument. Right. Because once we get attached to an argument, we, we just prosecute that one. But I, I think something you're alluding to, too, it makes me think of the so-called McNamara fallacy, which is named for the secretary of defense in Vietnam, who decided that we would use a metric to decide if we were winning the war. Uh, and it was our bodies versus their bodies. And by that metric, we were always winning. And so he's like, we're winning. Who's complaining? But there was obviously a lot of other important stuff that that metric didn't factor in. So I think we often decide that things are important because they're easy to measure. Uh, but there are many things that, you know, we don't measure them because they're important. And there are all these things that are important that are difficult to measure and difficult to quantify. And like you said, with that challenger engineer, he kept being asked, like, quantify your argument. You're an engineer. Quantify it, quantify it, quantify it. And he said, I can't. We don't have enough data. But here's the picture. He literally said it looks away from goodness was the best thing he could he could come up with. And they said, well, that's that's not a quantitative argument. And, of course, they launched and we know what happens. And I think obviously not on that level of, of gravity, but these personnel decisions are being made in that sort of ambiguous circumstance all the time. And you don't know – it's it's a, even a, like 
you could clear a guy to play a game and nothing happens and it could still be the wrong decision and you might never know like you right. you might never know but it's just like you you talk to I'm telling you I talk to these people I've I've sit there and watch them warm up players and like it's an inexact science like it's just it's just at the end of the day I got to make a call and I don't know if it it's just sort of like my feel but they trust my feel over everyone else on the team's feel and it's yeah. it's they're going to it's it's a it's not a responsibility I would want frankly that job is a very tough job I mean even even something that's very straightforward like like blackjack, right? Like if you play perfectly, uh, you win just a few more hands per like hundred, you know? And so we're talking about much more ambiguous things than that. So it's very much, you know, what I talk about using the term from a psychologist, Robin Hogarth, wicked learning environments, right? Where you can sometimes do the exact right thing and get the wrong outcome and vice versa. You can do the wrong thing and get the right outcome. And the question is in situations like that, where it's not golf, where you can see the results immediately of what you've done, how do you learn when the feedback sometimes, um, you know, doesn't tell you if your process was good or bad? Um, let's conclude with this. How do I, how do I and how do other people live this way? How do we, how do we get out of, cause I really, I do believe that everyone is better at their own job and their, what their own expertise is. If they're engaging a different part of their brain completely and, and you'll just think about problems in ways that you wouldn't necessarily think about a problem. It could, and, and I'm talking about problems that are very specific to your area of expertise. You might just have a brainstorm that it's like this other thing I was reading about. So like, how do you in your life train yourself to live this way? How, how does a normal person who feels themselves being sucked in to the, all these traps, whether it's as a parent or in their career, like, how do you correct it? Yeah, I mean, for the parent, again, I think there are a lot of forces that aren't – I think we need structural changes for parents because I think there are a lot of forces that are not allowing parents to do what they know is best, right, because of the way we set up systems. But as an individual, huh. one of the guys – because I don't think the onus should be on individual parents because if you're – again, if you're forcing selection at a certain time, then you're forcing people to do something that isn't the best for long-term development. So I think we need to think about it in a, in a system sense. But – um, and there are places where they have changes, like French National Development Soccer. They've incorporated a lot of this stuff. But in, in what way? Um, so they started decades ago uh, altering their development pipeline so that once kids get in, they're still they're still playing plenty of soccer. But they are they a, a kid a, a kid in the French development pipeline probably plays half as many formal games as an American kid of the same age. Hmm. Um, and they have a, this saying. One of the guys who helped design it, Ludovic de Bru, uh, said, "There's no remote control." By which he meant the coaches should not be micromanaging, so they only have 15 minutes when they're allowed to like give their feedback. And the and the kids while they're playing soccer, they vary up the challenge. You know, different size pitch or different type of ball, so that they're working in variability within that sport. And so they started turning that around decades ago. But we don't have like a singular pipeline, so I think that's hard to do in the United States. For me personally, I, I keep something I call a, a book of small experiments, which is kind of stupid. But um, every other month, I make like a hypothesis about some other interest I want to explore or something I want to learn. And I come up with an idea and I put it down in the book of how can I explore that. And then I find a way to do it and it forces me to keep like one foot outside of my world, which is me – Basically quoting one of the researchers who talks about avoiding so-called cognitive entrenchment or the Einstellung effect where you – once you find something that works once, you just keep doing it over and over and over even when it's not a, not appropriate. Uh, but well, that, I mean that's that's a fancy way of just saying like when you get a bunch of people who think the same way about yeah. the same thing in a room, they're probably going to make a lot of bad decisions. Yeah, yeah. So again, this guy Kevin Dunbar who, who's really studied that in detail – Basically, his conclusion was if you have a bunch of people in the room who have the same background, you might as well just have one person and because your decision making won't really get any better. Um, Accountability is easier that way, too. It's, yeah, your, it's yeah. only that guy's fault. <laughs> That's right. Well, th I mean, how much of decision making is about right like – trying to spread the burden if something goes wrong like that's a oh, it's a problem the, that that's the a huge number one motivator in the nba is job security yeah like how can i keep my job so and then there and we haven't even talked about that but that creates a whole different kind of um that dissuades people from making bolder decisions or, or more courageous decisions totally i don't know i haven't seen this for the nba but i saw some data for the nfl where coaches are so insecure in their job that like something like i can't remember how it was quantified but a second round pick is way more value than valuable than a third round draft pick in the nfl so you'd never you'd never trade a second round pick for a third round pick it's a huge difference um well obviously you'd never do that trade but um but coaches will trade like almost like one-to-one -one future second-round picks for third-round picks right now because 
they have no idea if two years from now they'll even be in the job. So they make these horrible decisions of discounting picks just because they have no job security whatsoever. And then I think you look at someone like, you know, the Patriots where they, they pile up all these second round draft picks because I think maybe the coach doesn't think they're going to get fired. So if I were, if I were like a general manager, I would target teams that turn over their coaches a lot and try to trade with them because the coach or general manager will be incentivized to discount picks. And well, they in the NBA, that is the thing that happens where, you know, you, you hear like, well, Pat Riley doesn't care about the 2025 first round pick. They just trade him in 2023, whatever the year is. You know, I don't know how true that is, but you do you do definitely see teams and general managers who make decisions based on the possibility. They're like, I'm not going to be here when the bill comes due for this yeah. decision I'm making right now. Um, we said something. You said something else interesting before about French. Oh, living. Li- so you you try to d- yeah, explore. Yeah. yeah, and and this guy, one of my favorite characters, is like one of the most you know eminent scientists in the world, and he's starting this program to try to despecialize the training of future scientists. He makes his people read something outside their field every day, and he says they always say. I don't have time. He says, you do have time. It's more important than whatever other thing you're doing. And go eat lunch away from your desk and meet the other people here because they'll tell you stuff you don't know and you'll make connections. I think that's, I mean, that's all obvious, but it's true. And like you, 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 I talk about this with people in basketball media all the time. You could literally all day long read smart basketball analysis every day. That's all you could do. You get the newsletters and it's 40 articles and you do feel this fear of like, well, if I don't read that one. I might, I might like miss this tidbit about Nikola Vucevic. That's like really the next time I talk about Nikola Vucevic, boy, I might, I might not have this thing. And really, you don't got to read all of it. And it would probably be more useful to read about whatever uh, that than that. And like it's, but it's just hard once you, your momentum is going in a certain direction to sure. to change it back. Yeah, I mean, our view gets more narrow, right? And and everything, especially with like search algorithms and stuff now it gets even more and more narrow by by design and so i, I think it's you have to proactively um stop your inertia or the, the biggest thing if i were a team though and i read this book is the biggest thing i would think about is my decision making process of when, when when we're all in a room who's yeah. in the room how does it work do i need a totally different voice in the room like i the, like i don't know how involved the the guy from the cleveland browns is uh, that the Wizards just hired, the, whoever is the Sam Hinkie of the Cleveland Browns, mm-hmm, I forget mm-hmm. his name. The Wizards just hired. That, that, that's interesting. Like I, that, I don't know how he, if he's going to be in the draft room, but he's going to be in the. But like I, I do, I do think that if I were running a team, I would, I would look to identify total basketball outsiders who are smart, and maybe they're interested to come work for my team and help my decision making process. Yeah. That would be the number one takeaway. For I me. mean, I would totally, I literally, like I said, the people from Chapter Ten, I would go try to hire some of the super forecasters because their decision making processes have proven to be excellent over a large number of years, and they're making these forecasts about things that the, the the range of forecasts they have to make are so wide they can't possibly know about all these things beforehand. So I would get someone like that in the room, not because I'm necessarily going to take their advice, but because I think they they have shown in groups they become more accurate as individuals when they're teamed with one another because they make one another's process better. So I would actually literally get one of them or engage the so-called good judgment project where where some of them work. Um, and I'd also be wary of in order of information because it turns out that if a, especially a boss, but the first person that gives information in a meeting causes this like anchoring to that and everyone kind of stays closer to it. So I would start meetings like Final Jeopardy, you know, where everyone has to give an idea and then they reveal it at once so that you're not following you. And you have a you have a part of your book where you, they talk about I think it's actually NASA where someone in some department of NASA created this system where everyone was contributing notes and everyone had to read everybody else's notes and it wasn't just a top down kind of culture. It's really interesting. Anyway, the book is called Range: Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. It's fascinating. It's breezy. It sounds super scientific, and it, it is, but it isn't when you read it. And your first book is called The Sports Gene, which is like fantastic and talks about you know why are there so many good jamaican sprinters why do kenyans own the marathon and all this stuff they're both great and uh david epstein congrats on all your success and thanks for stopping in thank you very much for having me 